Okay, welcome everyone to our presentation. We're excited to tell you about Herald, so thanks for coming. Let's get started. Herald is an observability solution that simplifies the deployment of the Elk stack, a popular set of tools used for monitoring the health and performance of software systems. It allows software developers to conveniently collect and explore telemetry data, including logs, traces, and metrics through a single user-friendly interface. In this presentation, we're going to start by examining what observability is, why it's important, and the challenges involved in implementing an observability solution. We'll then look at existing solutions in the observability space. After that, we will outline how Herald fits into this solution space before diving into an overview of what Herald is and what it does. Finally, we will examine some of the design decisions and implementation challenges we faced in building Herald. Observability is the ability to understand how a system is functioning based on its outputs and behaviors. It uses three types of telemetry data, often referred to as the three pillars of observability, logs, traces, and metrics. This data provides visibility into a software system and allows development teams to get to the root cause of various issues to improve performance. Below, we take a closer look at each type of data. <clears throat> the first type of data we'll look at is logs. Logs are records of events or messages a software application or system generates. They are typically very detailed and provide information about a specific event or action within a software system. Information contained in logs includes timestamps, message content, severity level, and other contextual information. The second type of data we look at is traces. Tracing is a method of analyzing a software system by collecting data about the different stages of a request as it passes through various components or services of the system. It involves creating a trace that includes information about each step of the request. A trace comprises one or more spans. A span represents a specific piece of work performed by a specific service within the request path, such as an HTTP request or a call to a database. Spans contain important information, such as the start and end times of the work, as well as any metadata that might be relevant to understanding the span. The trace can help engineers identify the different services the request passes through and how they interact with each other. By analyzing this trace, developers can determine where the request spent the most time and which services were involved. This information can be used to identify performance bottlenecks, optimize the system, and improve the user experience. And finally, the third type of data we look at is metrics. Metrics are like vital signs for a software system. They are a numeric representation of data measured over intervals of time. They help developers understand the health of a system. By setting performance goals and baselines, metrics allow developers to track whether a system is meeting its targets and catch problems before they become critical. Logs, traces, and metrics work together to provide developers with observability of their software systems, allowing them to diagnose issues and improve system performance. To illustrate how developers can use logs, traces, and metrics together to diagnose a problem and help them fix it, let's walk through an example. Suppose a developer is responsible for a web application that allows users to purchase items online. Upon checking some metrics related to the performance of the app, the developer notices that the average response time and error rate for the app's checkout page have increased. They decide to investigate further to see what might be causing the slowdown. 
Based on these metrics, the developer uses tracing to follow a request through the system and pinpoint where a potential error may be occurring. They choose a recent transaction that experienced a slow response time and use a tracing tool to follow the request as it moved through the system. The tracing tool shows that the request spent a significant amount of time in a particular service responsible for verifying the user's payment details. The developer suspects there may be an issue with this service and that further investigation is required to track down the cause. The developer decides to check the logs associated with the service in question. In the logs, the developer sees a large number of errors related to the payment gateway API being used by the service. The logs also show that the payment gateway API has recently changed its authentication method, which may be causing the errors. Based on this information, the developer updates the service to use the new authentication method for the payment gateway API. They deploy the updated service to production and monitor the application's metrics, traces, and logs to verify the issue has been resolved. Alone, each pillar of observability provides valuable information, but not a complete picture. The metrics alerted the developer to the issue. The tracing helped them pinpoint where the issue was occurring, and the logs provided more detailed information about the root cause of the issue. By having insight into all three, developers get complete visibility of their system's health and performance. But knowing that observability is important is one thing. Making software systems obser observable is another. How does a development team aggregate their telemetry data into a single location in order to be visualized and analyzed? The solution to this problem involves solving several smaller problems. Let's examine each of them. The first problem that needs to be solved is how to collect the data. Typically, this is accomplished with a collection agent installed on each component of the software system that is going to be observed. This collection agent is responsible for collecting the data from the component and shipping it to some central location. But before the data is shipped to the central location, there's another problem to solve. At this point, the data is still raw and unstructured. It will need to be processed and transformed into a form or structure suitable for a particular analysis. Thus, a data processor is needed before the data goes anywhere else. The next problem concerns the central location. There needs to be some data storage component that can be queried for the purpose of visualization and analysis. This data store should handle the continuous inflow of data and enable fast and efficient queries for real-time data analysis. The final problem to be solved is how to visualize that data so it can be gleaned for meaningful insights. What is required is an intuitive and easy to use UI. <clears throat> Thus, to achieve observability, a solution is needed that performs the following four functions, data collection and shipment, data processing and transformation, data storage and data visualization. Next, we look at some of the existing solutions out there that aim to solve the observability problem for development teams. Several companies offer various observability tools to satisfy most developers' needs. One of the benefits of using these observability tools is that they are typically easy to set up and feature rich. Some of those extra features include infrastructure monitoring, network monitoring, and error tracking. However, some commercial solutions may not be a good fit for software team teams concerned about data and infrastructure ownership. In particular, teams working with sensitive data or in highly regulated industries may be wary of using third-party solutions due to concerns about data privacy, security, and compliance. These teams may prefer to keep complete control over their data and infrastructure, including the ability to choose where 
and how it is stored and processed. Using a commercial solution may require them to relinquish some of this control. Commercial solutions also come at a cost that may be too high for smaller companies. Additionally, certain commercial solutions may create vendor lock-in situations where a company becomes dependent on a particular solution's products and ecosystem. In addition to commercial observability solutions, Various open source observability tools are available that can provide a cost-effective alternative for developers. These tools offer various features for collecting, analyzing, and visualizing log, metric, and tracing data, while also providing flexibility in terms of data ownership and infrastructure. They also don't lock organizations into a particular vendor. While open source observability tools offer many advantages, such as data ownership and cost savings, Deploying and managing these tools can be significantly more complex than commercial solutions. Piecing together various observability tools in order to collect, process, store, and visualize telemetry data can require substantial time and expertise. This may not be fe feasible for smaller development teams. The complexity involved in this process is abstracted away with the commercial solutions. That's where Harold comes in. Herald bridges the gap between commercial and open source solutions. It is an open source observability solution that abstracts away the complexity of setting up open source tools while offering development teams the ability to maintain data and infrastructure ownership. Further, the only cost of using Herald is the cost of provisioning and using the AWS resources on which it is deployed. Herald was built for growing applications that have reached a size where the ability to monitor their health and performance has become an issue. The growing complexity of these apps requires their development team to consider a comprehensive observability solution. What is needed is a solution comprised of a set of battle-tested observability tools. Herald is built on the Elk stack, comprised of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. The Elk stack is a popular set of open source tools commonly used for log management and analysis. The full ELK ecosystem also offers tools for trace and metric data. The combination of these tools provides a complete observability solution. Combining other open source tools into a complete observability solution is also possible, but managing these other tools necessitates developers becoming familiar with the separate documentation associated with each tool. These docs may be sufficient for understanding how each tool works in isolation, but are less helpful when the tools are combined. The Elk stack, on the other hand, is managed by a single organization, Elastic. Elastic provides unified documentation on the entire stack, making it easier to troubleshoot issues that may arise between the various components of the stack. There is also a strong support community on which developers can rely. The comprehensiveness of its documentation across the stack, the strong community of supporters, and its popularity make the Elk stack an ideal choice for developers just getting started with observability. The Elk stack is also battle tested as several commercial solutions use it in their own offerings. Setting up the Elk stack can be challenging, particularly for developers new to observability. The configuration details involved in setting up each component of the stack for complete observability can be overwhelming. However, Herald simplifies the process by abstracting away the complexity, providing an effortless deployment of the stack. With just a few commands, developers can quickly get started with Herald. The Herald pipeline encompasses the main components required to achieve observability, data collection and shipment, data processing and transformation, data storage, and data visualization. Let's revisit the observability implementation challenges from earlier and introduce the components in Herald that are used to solve them. The first challenge that needs to be solved in order to achieve observability is collecting data from the various components of a software sy system and shipping them to some central location. Herald uses two separate tools for data collection and shipment, FileBeat for log data and the application performance monitoring agent for traces and metrics data. FileBeat is a collection agent designed for collecting and shipping log data. Its primary function is to continuously scan for new log data and send such data to Logstash, where it is processed and transformed. 
FileBeat is not part of the Herald deployment, but it is installed separately on the user's application servers. After installation, it must be configured to monitor specific log files and output the data to Logstash. For collecting and shipping traces and metrics data, we have Elastic APM agents. APM agents are open source libraries that collect data generated by an application. These agents are written in the same programming language as the application and can be easily installed like any other library. Once installed, the user then instruments, instruments their code to allow the agents to collect tracing and metrics data. The APM agents then ship the data to the APM server for processing. The second challenge that needs to be solved to achieve observability is data processing and transformation. This component of the pipeline must be capable of processing data for particular analysis and transforming the data into a format that is accepted by the data storage component. Herald uses two separate tools for data processing and transformation, Logstash for logs and the APM server for traces and metrics. Within the Herald pipeline, Logstash is configured to ingest data from FileBeat. The user must configure Logstash with an appropriate filter that enables a specific transformation of the ingested data to support a specific application use case. For example, a user may use the GeoIP filter to add information about the geographical location of IP addresses. Once the data is processed, it is sent to Elasticsearch for storage and indexing. The APM server comprises two parts, the Elastic Agent and the APM integration. Elastic Agents are installed on the user's application servers to receive different data types, such as metrics and traces, from the APM agents. The Elastic Agent can be updated with configurations enabling the collection of new or different data sources. The configurations are implemented through agent policies. The APM integration is one of those configurations that gets specified within an agent policy. The Elastic Agent with the APM integration acts as the APM server, which lives entirely on the user's application server. The APM server accepts tracing and metrics data from the APM agent. The APM server then processes the data, which includes validating it and transforming it into Elasticsearch documents before sending it on to Elasticsearch. The third challenge to be solved to achieve observability is the data storage component. The data store is where data will be housed and made available for querying by the visualization component. Elasticsearch is a distributed search and analytics engine and document store. It stores complex data structures serialized as JSON documents. Elasticsearch stores and indexes data in a way that enables near real-time searching. It is a durable data store, which means it can persist long-term data as needed. Within the Herald pipeline, Elasticsearch receives data from Logstash and the APM server. It acts as a storage component that can be queried through Kibana to be visualized. The final challenge to be solved in order to achieve observability is the data visualization problem. Data sitting in the data store is only good if it can be visualized and analyzed. Herald uses Kibana as its data visualization component. Kibana is a powerful open source data visualization and exploration platform. It provides a user-friendly interface for searching, analyzing, and visualizing large volumes of data in real time. With Kibana, you can search, observe, and analyze your data and visualize your findings in charts, gauges, maps, and graphs. Here is a sample of what it looks like to view logs in Kibana. From here, developers can search and analyze log data. And here is a sample of what it looks like to view a trace in Kibana. From here, developers can view a trace for a particular request. And finally, here is a sample of what it looks like to view metrics in Kibana. From here, the developers can gain a better understanding of their overall health of their system. Before we transition to the next phase of our discussion, let's briefly recap the key topics we've discussed so far. First, we covered why an organization may need an observability solution. Then we looked at how logs, traces, and metrics are used for active monitoring and debugging. 
We then discussed the challenges with implementing an observability solution and where Herald fits into the landscape of existing solutions. Finally, we looked at the Herald pipeline and how Herald collects logs, traces, and metrics and turns them into usable observability data. At this point, we're going to transition to discussing how we built Herald, as well as some of the implementation challenges we faced and the design decisions we made. Some of the topics we'll cover include building Herald with Amazon Web Services and Cloud Development Kit, deploying containerized applications, service discovery within the Herald application, securing communication with Elasticsearch nodes, creating a multi-node Elasticsearch cluster, auto-scaling the Elasticsearch cluster, and how each application fits into Herald's overall architecture. But before we discuss the specific details related to building Herald, let's take a look at Herald's overall architecture. The first thing to note is that both Herald and the user's application reside within the same virtual private cloud within AWS. When deploying Herald, existing VPCs within the user's account will be automatically displayed for the user to select which VPC within which to deploy Herald. This ensures that the user's application can communicate with Herald without additional configuration. Looking at the center of the diagram, we have a private subnet where most of Herald's services are deployed. We have two Elasticsearch clusters, one for master eligible nodes that are responsible for management of all Elasticsearch nodes, and one for auto-scaling data and adjustion nodes. We have a Logstash cluster for processing log data before it gets stored and indexed in Elasticsearch. And we have a fleet server cluster for enrolling and managing Elastic agents. Note that both the Logstash and fleet server clusters have load balancers in order to distribute loads across the clusters evenly. On the right side of the diagram, we have a public subnet where the Kibana application, which requires a public IP address, is deployed. Kibana receives queries from a user and sends requests to the Elasticsearch cluster. Here you can also see that we've listed a number of other AWS resources that are part of Herald's architecture. Cloud map for service discovery, Elastic file system for centralized volume storage for containerized applications, CloudWatch for application logging, and a Lambda function, which we will discuss a bit further in the presentation. And finally, on the left side of the diagram, we have a public subnet where the user's application resides. Applications shown here are not part of Herald's deployment, but are necessary for instrumenting a user's application to send data into Herald. Two applications are installed on the user's architecture. FileBeat, which sends log data to Logstash so that the data can be processed before getting stored and indexed in Elasticsearch, and APM Server, which sends traces and metrics data to Elasticsearch. Herald was built and deployed using AWS's Cloud Development Kit, or CDK. CDK is an infrastructure as code tool that allows a developer to provision AWS resources using the same code a developer uses to build an application. For example, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, or Java. All of Herald's applications, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and Fleet Server, are installed using Docker containers. As such, Herald uses AWS's Elastic Container Service, or ECS, which is a fully managed container orchestration service designed to facilitate the deployment, management, and scaling of containerized applications. ECS can deploy containers on AWS's Elastic Compute Cloud Service or on its serverless application hosting service, Fargate. The first two components in building Herald are the Elasticsearch and Kibana applications. As discussed earlier in the presentation, Elasticsearch is the database where data is stored and indexed, while Kibana provides the user interface that allows for querying and visualizing the data stored in Elasticsearch. As a front-end application, Kibana requires a public IP address and is placed in a public subnet, while Elasticsearch is placed in a private subnet to ensure that it is inaccessible from outside of the Herald virtual private cloud. However, in order to deploy Kibana, Kibana must know Elasticsearch's IP address because a successful Kibana deployment requires confirming a successful connection to the Elasticsearch service. Otherwise, 
Kibana will generate an error and fail to run. But when using Cloud Development Kit to deploy applications through ECS, the IP address of the host server is unknown until after the deployment of all applications is complete. So this presented a problem. How can Kibana be configured to communicate with Elasticsearch if Elasticsearch's IP address cannot be ascertained until after deployment? To deploy applications that must be configured to communicate with other services, but where the IP address is unknown at the time of configuration, we used AWS's Cloud Map service to create a private DNS network. This gave us the ability to assign DNS host names to each service, where each host name would resolve to the IP address that eventually gets assigned to that service after deployment of the Herald application. Now that Kibana knows where to locate Elasticsearch through service discovery, there is still one more step that needs to be implemented in order for Kibana to make a successful connection to Elasticsearch. The communication must be secured using TLS. In fact, any, any application that communicates with an Elasticsearch instance must do so through a secured connection, even if that application is another Elasticsearch instance. This ensures that all data stored in Elasticsearch is only accessed by authorized applications. To enable TLS, a dedicated certificate authority needs to be created using Elasticsearch's certificate generation utility. This certificate authority is then used to generate certificates for Kibana and each Elasticsearch node, which they then use to establish secure connections with each other. One challenge we encountered was that Kibana and Elasticsearch nodes need access to TLS certificates before they can be successfully deployed. This meant that these certificates needed to be created as part of the overall deployment of the Herald application, but before deployment of the Kibana and Elasticsearch services. To create these certificates, a separate instance of Elasticsearch was deployed, whose sole purpose was to create these certificates using Elasticsearch's certificate generation utility, as well as to set some initial configuration variables in the initial Elasticsearch node. For any application that would need to communicate with Elasticsearch, certificates for that application were generated at this time as well and uploaded to a central Elastic file system volume. With the certificate volume now available and populated with the appropriate certificates, any application that will communicate with Elasticsearch will need to mount this volume to the Docker container within which the application is run. And finally, once the certificates have been created and the initial Elasticsearch node had been configured, we used a Lambda function to shut down the Elasticsearch instance that was used to create the certificates. This Lambda function was configured to listen for completion of the deployment of the Elasticsearch cluster, which ensures that the setup Elasticsearch instance was not shut down prematurely. Now that the Elasticsearch and Kibana applications have been properly configured and deployed, a new challenge is presented. How can the Elasticsearch service handle large fluctuations in the volume of telemetry data that's being generated? When things are running well, telemetry data will be generated in a predictably steady stream. However, data generation can multiply significantly when problems arise. A key feature of Herald is the ability to ingest and index data in real time and it must continue to do so even under heavy loads. However, it's unlikely that a single Elasticsearch node can handle continuous high spikes in volume. In order to handle large fluctuations in telemetry data, Herald distributes the incoming data stream across multiple Elasticsearch nodes. This offers a number of benefits. Multiple nodes are available to handle incoming requests, whether queries from Kibana, or data ingestion from log stash and APM servers, and data distribution and replication across multiple nodes. To have multiple nodes of Elasticsearch work together, though, we need to configure them to form a single cluster. And to do this, first, we have to tell these nodes that we need them to form a multi-node cluster. And second, we have to tell them where to find each other. 
step one is relatively straightforward. And for step two, since we are using AWS Cloud Map for service discovery, in the configuration file for each node, we can just specify the DNS host names of other nodes. So for example, in the configuration file for ES01, that is to the left of the screen, uh, which stands for Elasticsearch node number one, we just list the DNS host names of node two and three. So now in our updated architecture diagram, the nodes are now working together as a single unit. And now to communicate with this cluster, Kabana would, for example, send a request to one of the Elasticsearch nodes. And then the Elasticsearch cluster with this internal knowledge of node responsibilities and data distribution will determine how to process and respond to that request. And now recall that the reason we are setting up multiple nodes of Elasticsearch uh, is because we want to be able to deal with a spike in telemetry uh, data generation. And to further ensure that Herald is ready to deal with the spike in telemetry data generation, we also have built-in auto scaling for the Elasticsearch cluster. And this Elasticsearch cluster that we just saw will scale up when the CPU utilization for the cluster when the average CPU utilization for the cluster is 60% or above. To avoid data loss though, this cluster only scales up and not down. For, as shown in this diagram here, uh, for auto scaling, Herald keeps the three initial nodes as is, and then it creates a separate auto scaling group that starts with one node, and then it scales up to meet increasing demands. And with that, we have successfully added Elasticsearch and Kibana to Herald. The next component we will add is Logstash. And you might recall that Logstash is used to transform and enrich logs. So it also needs to handle the peak loads, which implies that we're going to need multiple nodes of Logstash. Um, so in Herald, we have two Logstash nodes with the load balancer in front of them. And one good thing with Logstash is that these nodes are working independently. So we don't need to uh, worry about service. Uh, we, we don't need to worry about node discovery like we did with Elasticsearch. And with Logstash added, here is updated architecture diagram. We still have Kibana to the far right of the screen. And then we have Elasticsearch cluster just to its left. And we see the Logstash uh, nodes added in here. Again, as we said previously, we have two nodes of Logstash with the load balancer in front of them. And then to the far left, FileBeats is installed on the application server. It collects the logs and then sends them to Logstash. And then Logstash then enriches the data and then sends it to Elasticsearch. With Logstash added, we have now finished building our logging pipeline, which is the um, upper portion of this pipeline that is shown here. So this pipeline consists of FileBeat, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. We now need to build the tracing and matrix pipeline. And for that, we are going to need four new components. And the first two components are the two different types of agents we need. The first agent is an Elastic APM agent, and these are specialized agents which are designed to collect raw traces and metrics data from an application. And then the second type of agent is Elastic agents, which are kind of general purpose agents, and we can upgrade their capability by adding more integrations. And these agents can also collect a wide variety of data from different services. The third component we need to talk about is a fleet server. Uh, the fleet server uh, provides us a centralized way to manage the elastic agents. And then finally, the APM server, which is the fourth component, its function is to validate the data that the APM agents are sending to it. And then it transforms that data into Elasticsearch documents before sending it to Elasticsearch. Um, there are two ways this four components that we just talked about uh, can be set up for collecting traces, uh, traces and metrics. Um, in the first architecture, we have a centralized fleet server and APM server. And 
And in the second architecture, we have a centralized fleet server, but with this architecture, we have a distributed APM server. So Herald uses architecture two, which has a centralized fleet server and a distributed APM server. So before we go into how this architecture looks like, uh, let's just take a let's just talk briefly about what fleet server and APM server actually is. Um, at least for the fleet uh, for the fleet server, it is really an elastic agent with a special integration, and we install this agent on on an EC2, and that allows the EC2 to act as a fleet server. Similarly, for the APM server, again, it's an elastic agent with a special integration. And again, we install this on an EC2, our application server. Uh, and this elastic agent will then act as an APM server. So all these four components that we just talked about, the APM agent, the elastic agent, the APM server, and fleet server, are combined to work as shown here. So starting from the left, we have the application server. And in the application server, we install the APM agent. For a node.js server, for example, this would mean that you have to install an APM an NPM package and inserting a middleware in your code. The APM agent then is going to collect the raw traces and metrics data and then send that data to the APM server and this APM server, uh, we also installed in the application server, takes that data from the APM agent and then validates it and then transforms it to Elasticsearch documents before sending it to Elasticsearch. And in the middle part of the screen, we have the fleet server and the APM server communicates with the fleet server to enroll into a policy. And this policy is essentially control the behavior of the elastic agents, including the integrations that this elastic agent is going to have. And these policies are stored in Elasticsearch. So the fleet server will constantly check if these policies have changed. And if they have, then the fleet server is going to update all the elastic agents that, that are enrolled in that policy. So using this architecture um, with a centralized fleet server and distributed APM server has its advantages and disadvantages. So speaking about the pros first, first, this architecture is more resilient as there are more as there are more APM server nodes. And second, the number of APM server grows as the number of application server grows. So the user does not have to worry about scaling the APM server. And then third, uh, there is a reduced cost. Uh, there is a reduced cost, and that is because data is collected and transformed locally, and also the cost is reduced because we are utilizing users' existing application server to act as APM server as well. And last, also there is reduced latency because data is collected and transformed locally, versus in architecture one where data was first collected locally and then sent over to the application uh, applica the APM server over the network. In terms of disadvantages, uh, the first disadvantage is that it can be more uh, it can be harder to manage the growing number of APM server nodes which are distributed across uh, the application servers. And second, it could be harder to scale uh, in general because the APM server shares resources with your application. So incorporating fleet server and APM server into our architecture diagram, uh, we can see here first the fleet servers, uh, which are in the middle, uh, toward the middle part of the screen. They are used to manage the elastic agent. In this case, the only elastic agent it is managing is a elastic agent, which is installed on the app server to act as APM server. And then the elastic agent collects data from an APM agent and then sends it to Elasticsearch. Uh, with fleet server and APM server added, uh, we have finished building Herald. So that was the lower part of this pipeline uh, that is that is currently shown here. And as a recap as to the steps we took the, uh, to build Herald, the first two components that we added are Elasticsearch and Kibana. And while adding those components, uh, we had to solve a couple of implementation challenges and make some design decisions. 
The first one was deploying Elasticsearch on a private subnet and deploying Kibana on a public subnet. The second uh, issue, uh, the second thing was we had to solve the service discovery issue using AWS Cloud Map. And then lastly, we had to encrypt all communication using TLS. Uh, after adding Elasticsearch and Kibana, we talked about why we needed multiple nodes of Elasticsearch. And the reason we needed them was to deal with spikes and telemetry data generation. And we talked about configuring the Elasticsearch nodes to form a single cluster so they work together. Uh, to do that, we had to, uh, we had to deal with node discovery. And to further ensure that Herald is more, uh, is more capable of dealing with spikes and telemetry data generation, we also built in auto scaling for Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, next, we talked about adding Logstash, which is used to enrich logs. And then lastly, we talked about adding Fleet Server and APM Server. Uh, as a reminder, Herald uses architecture with distributed APM Server and centralized Fleet Server. So building Herald was a lot of fun and it involved solving a lot of challenges. Uh, we strongly feel that we have successfully built a robust observability solution. However, there are still quite a there's still room for a lot of improvements. Um, so for example, the first feature we want to add in the future, uh, in the future uh, is that we wanna auto scale the Logstash cluster as well. So it is better equipped to deal with spikes and telemetry data generation. Second, we want to add Kafka in front of Logstash to minimize the risk of data loss. Third, we wanna implement AWS S3 cold storage and also install a mechanism for log rehydration. Doing so would lead to lower cost of data storage and enhance Elasticsearch performance. And lastly, we want to auto scale Elasticsearch cluster based on storage and CPU utilization and not just based on CPU utilization. And with that, our presentation is complete. We want to thank everyone for listening to us today. And if you're still here with us after this long presentation, we want to now give you a chance to ask questions that you may have. All right, looks like we've got one question here. Um, what was the hardest part about building Herald? If you wanted to take that one, Koshik. Sure, I think the hardest part was definitely encrypting communication with TLS. Um, because anytime we were adding new components, we had to make sure the security settings were correctly configured. And then we also had to make sure the certificates existed in the right place. So that kind of slowed us down a lot and made, made the project much more difficult. Okay. And uh, we've got another question here. Um, says, this solution appears to depend on Amazon cloud infrastructure. Is that correct? If so, how difficult would it be to build similar solutions within other cloud providers? Um, I can take a stab <clears throat> okay. me, uh, sure. at answering that. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And yes, you're correct. This was deployed um, 
using Amazon's cloud infrastructure, Amazon Web Services. Um, and as far as the other question about how difficult would it be to build a similar solution with other cloud providers, uh, it's a great question. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that just because we really only dealt with um, AWS as opposed to you know something with um, like something like Google or uh, Microsoft's cloud infrastructure. Uh, but one thing I can tell you is that it was very difficult to um, deploy this because um, I think the, the Elk stack is not necessarily uh, meant to be deployed programmatically in a way that doesn't require any input from the user. Um, so it was rather challenging to do that. So uh, I think just speaking generally from our experience doing this using AWS, um, I imagine that it would be rather challenging to do this on, on any other platform, uh, which has less to do most likely with the platform that you're deploying it on and more to do with the ELK stack itself and just some of the challenges that are inherent in trying to piece everything together um, automatically. So I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. And got another question. Um... What necessitated using two separate pipelines, one for logs and the other for traces and metrics? Why couldn't you have a single pipeline for all of that data? Um, I'll take I'll I'll take this one. Um, it, it's actually possible for the Elastic Agent and the with the APM integration or actually, sorry, with the Elastic Agent using other types of integrations for it to also collect log data. However, the, there is an issue that arises is that the way it works with Elastic is that you can't actually have two separate outputs. So you either have to output everything to Elastic Search or output everything to Log Stash. And since log stash is just for logs, um, we needed something for the traces and metrics data. So that needed to go to Elasticsearch. And then um, for the log data, we wanted to have the use leverage the capabilities of log stash, the data processing capabilities of log stash for processing logs. So that's why we needed to build the two separate pipelines. Okay, we've got another question. Um, roughly what percentage of the time spent working on this project was spent on additional research to fill knowledge gaps not filled by LS material? I can, I can. Yeah, sorry, go on. Okay, I'll. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I don't know if I can say what percentage, but uh, I would say there was a lot of additional research. I mean, I would I would say that LS definitely gave us the fundamentals without without having the fundamentals that we had from launch school, from the core curriculum and capstone. Um, I think this project would have been pretty much impossible, but it required a lot of extra research in terms of we had to learn AWS CDK. Uh, we had to learn about how the ELK stack worked uh, just in general. Um, but yeah, all of the launch school material gave us that foundation to be able to do conduct that research. So, you know, I guess that kind of answers that question. Um, another question, was observability an interesting space to build a capstone project in? Were there any pros slash cons that stood out? Um, I can take this one. Uh, okay. I think in general, when we started, we definitely had a strong interest and it's kind of hard to pinpoint why that interest was there. I mean, the interest was just there when we discovered this uh, solution space and the problem space. I think the interest definitely grew as we started working through the project. Um, and 
I think the reason, I think one of the reason uh, we wanted to build a solution in this space was that we found that first we found that setting up this elastic search log stash and Kavana was really difficult. And then we found that a lot of commercial solutions are kind of using that um, in there. A lot of commercial solutions are built using Alka stack. But then if someone like me, for example, wants to have an automated way of just not of setting those tools up, like there's no current solution that existed. So we kind of wanted to build a tool that we know that is good for uh, good for the team now. And we're hoping this solution can grow with the team as well. Um, so I think that kind of led to uh, using the specific uh, solution we chose and also what kind of drove us in a way to build a solution in the space. And we've got another question here. How was the development workload distributed across the team members? And what proportion of the time was spent doing CDK and config? I can take uh, those. I can... I guess one too. Uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Wayne. Oh, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we kind of took a divide and conquer uh, approach as far as uh, distributing workload um, across the team. And as far as the course of the time spent doing CK and config, um, I, I don't know that I can say what proportion of time. It's definitely a lot. Um, you know, CDK, Cloud Development Kit, is the main API that we use to build Herald. Uh, but CDK really is just sort of like a API wrapper around a thousand other smaller APIs. Um, so learning CDK really just took a, a large investment of time because of all of the different resources that we use to deploy Herald and all of the related APIs that we had to learn in order to do that um, successfully. So yeah, um, I, don't, I couldn't give you a specific number, but definitely a, large, a significant portion of the time was spent um, learning CDK and learning how to configure everything to work properly together. Thanks for the question. Um, another question. Uh, speaking of workload, did you guys follow any particular collaboration ideology? Example, Agile. Um, I guess uh, I would say, yeah, like the closest, uh, I guess Agile would be the one that best resembles what kind of how we organized our workflow. Um, we always sort of, we, what we ended up doing uh, th this wasn't right away, but later on in the process was we ended up setting up a Trello board and we'd organize what the specific tasks that we needed to do. And we'd have some tasks that were on deck, other tasks that were in progress, other tasks that were completed. And then we'd have different members of the team assigned to these different tasks and, and we'd be regularly meeting up to you know discuss any issues or problems we'd have with our work work and yeah that was sort of the the how we collaborated in in completing the project okay i guess if there's no further questions then we'll wrap up so want to say thanks for everybody for coming out and thanks for all the questions.